Aloha, and welcome to another edition of The Creative Life, a creative collaboration between the American Creativity Association, Austin, and Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Darlene Boyd, your host for today. Joining me from Forestville, California, Northern California, are Barefoot Wine founders and New York Times bestselling authors, Michael Houlihan and Bonnie Harvey. Stay with us as we discuss climate solution, creative entrepreneurship, and we'll be right back. Hello, Michael, and hello, Bonnie. I'm so glad to have this opportunity to chat with you, and I know our viewers are excited to know, learn about you some more and uh, find out just how you got where you are. Um, just to, to recap for you and also for our viewers, the creative life focuses on the creative process with many of our guests, but also features people who are known for living the creative life. And uh, you are both, you exempl exemplify both. And, and that's what we'll be talking about. But we're also gonna talk about the challenges that we have with climate change today. And uh, also how it seems to me that uh, social responsibility has been foremost in your thinking and your passion for any of your initiatives. And we'll talk about some of the hows and whys that, that you do so. So um, as we talk about the creative process, we recognize that in creative productive thinking, generally there are problems. And I've been reminded recently by one of our creative colleagues, Marilyn Schumann, that there are those people that sometimes look at problems and it just overwhelms them. And there are those that look at those problems that emerge and rank them and realize that there's opportunity there. And I think that's what you've done. So I'd like to start there. And you are the founders of Barefoot Wines, America's number one wine brand with that iconic label. So how'd you get there? Was wine always a passion for you or did it just happen? No, wine was not a passion for us. It was an opportunity that we found as a result of a problem that my client had. So problems, if you see them as challenges instead of problems, then you realize there's an opportunity. So the opportunity was $300,000 that was owed to a grape grower from a winery that had no money to pay. So Michael went out and collected uh, bottling supplies and bulk wine. So to make a long story short, that is how we got into the wine industry. It wasn't because of a passion for wine, but it was taking advantage of an opportunity that we saw as a result of recognizing a problem and looking at it from all sides. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, we, we recognize that our society and our infrastructure, we say this in, in our description of what we were going to uh, discuss today, and, and, we, and that's where we're about to begin. But we were never designed for this overwhelmingly change that we have in weather and uh, that we're now experiencing. But as you point out, Bonnie, it provides us with this opp opportunity and the challenge to get from the talking stage, which seemingly we've been doing for years, that climate change is coming. So it's here now and, and we really have to just move in and take over. So what are some of the new markets that you feel are created by climate change. And as you point out, Bonnie, the opportunities will transfer from wine now to climate change. Well, I'll, I'll jump in here if you don't mind, Bon. No, I don't mind at all. Okay, Thank great you. to be with you, by the way, Darlene. Um, so, I mean, everybody notices that we've got changes in the climate. You know, there's heat, there's fire. We have energy problems, we have flood problems. We challenges. Have challenges. We've got evacuation. We have water, wind, software issues. All of these are kind of the general areas that we can look at. Now, in Northern California, fire is a really big deal. In fact, I saw they had wildfires in Hawaii, of all places, you know, which is kind of a tropical wet climate. So things are changing. The real issue is do you see these as problems or opportunities? And I mean, yes, we have to reverse these. We have to do all we can to reverse this situation. But just take heat, for instance. Look at the opportunity for high temperature clothing on the market, like self-wicking fabrics, uh, 
air-conditioned suits, silly things like parasols that they used to have at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, they're going to come back. Uh, sun and heat protection, including insulation, shade, uh, convection design, environmentally safe air conditioning, temperature-controlled automatic venting, et cetera, drought-resistant horticulture, including low-water food crops, fire-resistant landscaping, and, and the, the list goes on, and that's just heat. Right. It's something else that we have been experiencing, not only here in Northern California, which has been pretty severe the past five years, but actually throughout the world. And um, we have been doing a lot of research on what we call not just us, but in our area, at least house hardening. How do you prepare your home and your grounds to better resist a fire or embers um, as they come your direction? And uh, for instance, okay. finding a need and filling it is what entrepreneurs and out-of-the-box thinkers do. So Michael found a need, although uh, the filling part of it is still up to someone else. He found a need to have all these house hardening services, such as venting and moving um, the irrigation to a place so that it can better support any fire that would come around and uh, uh, water pumps and um, any plants that are near the house and paints that are fire resistant on the house. He was looking for a service that had all of these services available in one spot and it doesn't exist. So there's a lot of opportunities uh, in the, the area of fire and fire mitigation and fire prevention and other fire concerns that we here in Northern California and throughout the world are particularly interested in. So just a few examples for you there, darling. Sure. sure. Uh, so the, with those examples, and, and they're examples that all three of us have been living through, and, and it's quite different in Northern California than Southern California in, in terms of space. And here in my little portion of Southern California, we're living on top of each other, condo after condo. And so there's, and, and true in Hawaii too, condos, condo living is, is, is quite prevalent. So uh, it seems everything you said, I would certainly like to see happen. But we're always facing, we being thinking of those around me and, and those that live in our environment here, we're always facing that argument with our homeowners associations. We talk about the plantings. It would be very easy, but then the board doesn't want to cut a single plant or remove and replace it with what you described, Michael. So uh, in your opinion, what is the role, government's role in all of this? How can, how can we get these ideas that you have in play? Well, the government, uh, it's interesting that you should ask that because just today in the news, the European Union has uh, agreed to put a tax on imported steel into the EU that was made in coal-fired plants and in other kinds of steel-making facilities where they're just polluting away and as a result can make the steel cheaper than the steel producers inside Europe who are under strict requirements to protect the environment. So they're going to level the playing field. So that's an example of what government can do. So now, even though you don't produce your steel in Europe, you can't sell to Europe if you're cheating. So now you have to follow those rules to sell into Europe. Same thing in California. The announcement was made that we're going to have uh, no more uh, internal combustion engines, new internal combustion engines for sale by a certain date. So this is kind of like the deadline approach of government. We've seen this in local communities where uh, you can't have leaf blowers anymore that are powered by gasoline. Now they have to be electric. Well, now, th that has been a county rule here, but it's also part of the HOA systems rulings. So that addresses what you'd mentioned before, Darlene. But what the government does is it creates a market that makes it possible for people to go into this new idea of, okay, well, if you can't have it this way, how are we going to have it? Now, everybody in Hawaii knows Lake Tahoe. 
Lake Tahoe was getting terribly polluted uh, with uh, engines that were running ski doos and uh, m- m- uh, motorboats, et cetera. Uh, and uh, they just they passed a law up there and they said, OK, by this date, we're going to have no more engines that are cooled by using the water in the lake. And so they said, well, that's going to put everybody out of business. That's going to ruin our recreational this and that. And it turned out that it actually created a market for these new engines. And so the idea is that if you put a law on it, you're going to get people to invest in it. And if people invest in it, you're going to make it affordable for the general public to buy those solutions. So the government plays a very, very important role in this. What about the timelines that are established on this? Because right now, everything seems critical to us uh, in terms of fires, for example. Some other things don't seem as urgent, but probably will become so. So how, who do we turn to to come up with a reasonable timeline for implementing some of these governmental suggestions? Well, I think you got to talk to the Your stakeholders. College. Your politicians, yeah. you have to talk to your citizens, your community, Chamber of Commerce. We really have to get everyone involved. It's it's not something that we have to leave up to the government uh, to tell us what to do. I think we've known for a long time that something had to be changed, and we've been negligent in making those changes. So I think we start today doing what we can do and recognizing that there's a lot of needs out there. Just opening our eyes and seeing what's going on and where the need is and whether it can be solved uh, in a short period of time with a small solution or a large period of time. You've got a lot of choices of opportunities out there to choose from. So it's up to the individual to do what they can do best. Yeah, the government is not going to be a cure-all. We can't just sit around and wait for the government to make choices. I mean, uh, the money is coming in from people who have done things the old way uh, that have hurt the planet. Uh, What we really need to do is to create markets. We have to create markets. And and one of the things we want to talk about today is this whole idea of affordability. Uh, In other words, uh, we got into this situation by choosing solutions that we thought were the cheap solutions. We didn't think they were the best solutions, but they were the cheap solutions because, you know, you could buy gas cheap and you could put it in your car and it would burn up into the air. And uh, so you didn't have to haul that gasoline around just like a battery. You have to haul around an electric car. Well, I mean, later what you put into the air comes back and costs you a fortune because now your fire insurance has doubled and your premium has doubled and your benefits have halved. So there's a lot of pressure just because of the changes that is economic pressure that's on people to want to have change and to seek out change. So it's a great opportunity for alternatives right now. And I've always said, if you want to make a change, you've got to put a buck on it. People don't do what they know they're supposed to do. They'll do what is cheaper. So when we're looking to come up with these solutions, sometimes it is better to really think about what you can do that is less expensive, how you can make a simple solution and you can turn it around quickly to your point, Darlene, that you mentioned earlier. What do we do first? Mm-hmm. Do what you can do that's inexpensive that people will want to buy because it's cheaper. Some, sometimes, uh, and, I, and I think not just with with what we're talking about, but in, in other phases and in other institutions and in other deliveries, that uh, sometimes people who are not authorities are put in positions of authority. And sometimes those folks that are not authorities are making the decisions. So it, it also is very broad based. Would you not agree that we really need to have people that have the vision and the foresight to recognize that there are consequences, even as you say, that, that you have to put the buck somewhere and put the support, but they may not be realizing that that financial support is needed and just moving ahead and things just become all boggled and abandoned and uh, perhaps are are worse than they were before. What do you think? 
Well, there's there's two things that we can do and that we do on a regular basis. One thing is vote. So uh, vote for anyone that's running for an office in your community, your county, your state, your government, you know, uh, federal government. Be sure to go out and vote after doing your due diligence, doing the research required to see what efforts they have made um, in the sustainability world. The other thing that we do on a regular basis is we spend our money. So where are you putting your money? Are you putting your money into toilet paper, which we all buy? And is that toilet paper taking down the forests in Canada and elsewhere? Or is there an alternative to that? We've got to think about how we vote with our money in our purchases. And if we are voting towards sustainability, and we do that as a group, as a community, as a nation, then the companies that aren't supporting uh, products and a lifestyle that is sustainable will eventually not be making money and therefore go out, go out of business. So support the businesses that believe in the same ideas that you do and that are supporting them. Uh, some of the situations that are going on in, in one, for example, uh, where there are oceans involved in Hawaii being a primary area for, for circumstances such as the coral dying. Uh, it, I think it's important that the experts are called in and often the experts are part of a research institution. And uh, right now there is an, a lab uh, being directed that flies over Hawaii and detects and is able to report back to us so that we can visually see that the coral is dying and it's still beautiful but it, it really truly needs to be saved before there are there is devastation and uh, on the other coast right now um, in the past few months uh, there's been the impetus to have wind farms out in the ocean and you know the first thought is the people that live there in new england and new jersey at the wonderful jersey shore you don't want to look at those big huge wind kind of things blocking your beautiful view of the sky and the ocean. But equally as important, they've been having more deaths of whales than they ever have before. I believe it was 32 in the last couple of months that have been washed up on the shore. And it's not necessarily the equipment itself, but it's the installation that uh, they believe now is offsetting the hearing of the whales and really disorienting them terribly so that they're not in their food service. So there are those kinds of consequences that really weren't anticipated and, and uh, hopefully there won't be too many of those situations. Uh, you do you do something wonderful and that is that um, you, you do give back in in many different ways with the excitement and and your development of any ideas that you have. And what is, can you tell us more about that? And I'm referring to the way you help nonprofits. Well, we like to uh, help businesses succeed. And one of the ways that we help businesses succeed is by helping them with their marketing efforts. Now, every business has to get the word out. So what we found at Barefoot Wine was that we could get the word out by supporting nonprofits and worthy causes, especially conservation causes. And by doing so, like, for instance, the Surfrider Foundation, they have chapters in Hawaii. Uh, they are one of the only groups that actually test the water every day for your safety. They're one of the, the first groups to start cleaning beaches. Uh, and they started out as a recreational organization. But what we did for them was we helped them raise funds by putting little surfboard tags on our bottles of wine in the supermarket that said, hang 10 for clean water. And the whole idea there was to get our buyers, who were typically a 37-year-old mom with two kids, uh, to- Or a dad. Or a dad, but it was mostly <laughs> women. 75% of wine is purchased by women. And to get them to realize that here's a group that is looking out for the safety of their children when they take their children to the, to the beach and they immerse their young bodies in the water what's in the water see so that type of an educational program helped us sell our wine 
not so much because we could say, hey, we're the good guys, we're doing this, but because the members of the Surfrider Foundation itself bought our wine. And they told their friends about it, their families and relatives. So this is what we call worthy cause marketing. And it's one of the things we do in our business life, where we help other business figure out how to market their product by supporting groups that if those groups are successful, it will help the sale of their product. So there's this relationship between success and a healthy planet, obviously. You know, if you're selling fishing poles, you want there to be more fish. You <laughs> see, uh, if you are, yeah. And, and, and good water for them to have and more clean water and clean water. Yeah, well, they're not going to be healthy fish if the if the water is not clean. And if you're if you're in Hawaii and you got a bed and breakfast, you definitely want that reef. Uh, if you if you're running a dive boat, you definitely want that reef. See, so there are there are people who have a financial interest in saving the planet. Those are the folks that we like to focus on because they make the biggest difference. They can educate their own people, and they can devote goods and services to support the groups that are doing it. So these are allies to your business, strategic allies. It's who succeeds if you succeed, and how do you succeed if they succeed? In case of the surf riders, we put a message on that tag, the surfboard that was on our bottle, that said what the surf, uh, the surf rider foundation was doing and we encouraged the hang 10 part was ten dollars we said give surf riders a donation of ten dollars that's what we were encouraging them to do and as a result of that our product became more popular in uh, beach resort areas and more people joined the surf riders foundation and people were educated about it the surf riders ended up with enough money to do their blue water task force cleaning the waters, and um, everybody won. It's just a matter of having your eyes open to the challenges that exist, the how to get the message out, and who your fellow travelers are. It's just wonderful what the, the efforts that you two make have, have made on be, behalf of, of just global in, improvement. And something that, as you're talking about, it seems like a great idea and simple to implement stickers on, on bottles and the idea to just not stop there and ask for the $10 donation just demonstrates clearly how creativity should not stop. It, it's just an, an ongoing effort. And that takes me to asking you to talk to us about something that I just find intriguing. And you're very gracious on your website and encourage people to go to your website in sharing a sample of some of your efforts. And that being, uh, t tell us about your business audio theater. I just did your sample and I am hooked and I definitely want to know, want to listen to more. So tell us about that. Well, one of the things we do is we speak to schools that teach entrepreneurship and we've spoken to 60 schools around the planet. And what we noticed about six years ago was that the students were coming to the auditorium already listening through their earbuds to something. Uh, besides us, of course. And so, you know, this just got to a point where it became ubiquitous. And so we started asking, what are you li listening to? You know, is it is it hip hop? Is it rock? Is it, is it, what is it? And they said, no, no, I'm listening to a podcast on how I can improve my business. Or no, I, I'm listening to War and Peace. Uh, the thing is so dang long, I can't sit <laughs> still for it. And this allows me the mobility uh, to listen uh, when I choose. And so we thought, gee, that's interesting, you know, mobile on demand. Uh, so we decided to take our you know, New York Times bestseller, The Barefoot Spirit, A Hardship, Hustle and Heart, Built America's number one wine brand, and converted it into an audio book. But we didn't want to just read it to people because we'd heard lots of audio books in the business world, and they were just read to you either by the author or some actor. So we said, well, what would happen if it was acted out by actors and actresses and sound effects and music and, you know, uh, dramatic spacing of time and, and motion. The business lessons were already put into story form. So there was lots of dialogue. We had a Hollywood troupe. You had, uh, come, 
Go you ahead. Have actors and a narrator, and it, it, you and feel sound it. effects and original music. Yes. And we've just done one for a client talking about how he had started a specialist on call, allowing uh, neurologists in this case to go into rural, rural hospitals via telemedicine. So um, that was a great achievement. And we were able to tell his story, which had a lot of the business lessons that he learned along the way in this same format, business audio theater. It's it's like theater for the mind. <laughs> yeah, and I invite I invite your listeners to uh, to uh, check out uh, the Barefoot Spirit, which is done in this business audio theater style. Uh, and the other one that we just completed and we're very proud of is the Brain Savers, uh, how a scrappy startup uh, uh, transformed uh, telemedicine and patient care. So they're both on Audible. They're both on Audible, and you, you'll enjoy them. Uh, they're little half-hour segments like podcasts, so you know you don't have to listen to the thing for three or four hours, but they are, uh, they are longer uh, series, so it's an entire series. Um, and and I, I think you'll get a kick out of it. I mean, everybody we've talked to is really appreciating it because we're teachers, and we're always looking for a new way to get through to the new generation. And when we saw those earbuds, we said, that's the way that's already there. <laughs> so I, it, that's the, you seized the moment, you took it and turned it into a great idea, and you made some enjoyable time for me. And I thoroughly in, encourage, as you have uh, our viewers, to look into your Audible product and uh, just enjoy them. And the actors, of course, you have uh, on the sample, we have the voice of Ed Asner in there, which now is is a, a lovely memory to have. And, and I know I heard you on another podcast reference the snarkiness, and yeah, it is perfect for some snarkiness in, in that. And some of your stories and tales are are just delightful. And we could also put ourselves and live vicariously in, in some of your efforts. I truly appreciate that you took the time today to be with me to be able to discuss. Uh, and once again, we never have enough time to do so. So I hope in the future that we'll, we'll come together and I hope to see you soon somewhere. And uh, my sincere thanks to you. And to our viewers, you have been watching The Creative Life on Think Tech Hawaii as we discussed a little bit about climate crisis challenges and relevant new concomitant solutions with Barefoot Wine founders, Michael Houlihan and Bonnie Harvey. Join us in two weeks for another episode of The Creative Life. And for now, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.